Greg Wells. Thanks, but for being here. It's an honor to be asked by you to, to oh, be here. This is this is. is this is really great to have you here and talk about some of the stuff we've done together. Mm -hmm. But some of the records that you've made are are now my benchmarks. So I really want to talk about those things. Twenty One Pilots we did not do together, but I love those records. I love their aesthetic. I, I love the quirkiness and the out of control nature of those two and i'd love to talk about run and go because i think that's one of the tracks you did right mm -hmm. i love the sort of theatricality of it the 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 fact that it just goes off into this other bridge and comes back to sort of a chorus that happened earlier in a tune but it's not quite it's just brilliant it's really orchestral and for those guys who are kind of emo punk rockers i thought that was such a stretch it was brilliant they are amazing i felt super fortunate to cross paths with them um and that was at a point you know in their career where they they hadn't even really kind of upstream to atlantic at that point they were wow. signed to fueled by ramen which was under the umbrella of atlantic but i don't know that anyone realized what was going to happen with them you know um but i'd seen footage of their live concerts and I met with them and we just clicked. Nice. Um, and you know, uh, Tyler in particular, who's writing all of that stuff, and uh, he's just, you know, he's like a mastermind guy. And so he would bring his Logic demos to me on his laptop, which were great. And I always feel like, I, I think there's a world of, of, of producers who feel like they need to cut everything from scratch again, you know, e regardless of, how great or bad the demo is. If you have access to the demo tracks, they don't want to do it. Cause, and there's, there's legal reasons why that's actually a good idea because it can be messy and you wind up bringing in, it's kind of like asking a camel to enter the tent when you start using other people's masters, <laughs> right? It, gets, it becomes this whole other yes. thing. Yeah. But creatively, which is the only thing I care about, yeah. If they get it right on the demo, I don't care that I wasn't involved. Who, who cares? The essence of the song is there. Done. At least build from it, you know? Totally. Maybe you're keeping just the core track. I really think, like, in a lot of people's demos, that magic, that essence, you know how it is. The first time you record a song, that's when all the magic is there. And yeah. every time you copy it, it's like a facsimile. Some of the energy just gets lost. So I always, if somebody's got good demos that have personality sounds, quirky sounds, I'm almost like, keep that. Okay, the tempo is going to be a little different. Let me see if we can bump it up, or compress it, whatever it is. And some of that magic is in that initial recording. And I hate re-recording stuff where you potentially lose that. So it's great to hear that you kept some elements of their demo. I mean, I, I have to. I feel like it's so hard to, to get anything to come through the, these emotionless speakers that move us, right? It's so hard to make a great record because we have no visual, we have no energy exchange from performer to audience. We only have this. And for me, music is a way bigger thing than just the sound of it. So. If it's coming off a demo, I feel like we got, we'd be foolish to not use it. You know, I actually I learned a lesson um, really the hard way, but I've never forgotten it. So I'll try and keep this quick. But like in 1994, I had some very ego-based dreams of wanting to be like a you know like in a rock band. I had my own like rock band. So I actually got a little indie record deal on the last legs of IRS. Records I remember this. Yes, with Miles Copeland. Yep. And so he, I did some demos on a on a eight track cassette machine that I had in a in a at the apartment I was living in, and I rented a drum room on Vineland in the Valley, and I was sharing with two other drummers, and I I brought like a couple mics, one was a Radio Shack, like a realistic PZM mic, or, and just recorded like some simple drum tracks, and I'd bring it back to that studio, and I'd play guitar and try to sing them. I'm not a good singer, but like the first songs I ever wrote, those were the demos that led to that little deal. The demos had a vibe even if they weren't the best songs in the world, and I'm clearly not a great singer, but that led to the record deal. And so I thought, okay, well, now we have like a little bit of a budget. We had a small budget, but it was enough to go to Rumbo Recorders for three weeks. And I remember Miles Copeland, who's a brilliant guy Absolutely. and full of great ideas. Yes. But I do remember him saying, 
I just want you to re-record these demos and just make it sound like a record because these demos don't sound like a record. And he was right. They sounded small sonically. Mm -hmm. It was done on like a little Mackie console. I didn't really know what I was doing at that point. Um, but I knew how to play. So that had a vibe of like it was played with an attitude. So anyway, we did that. We were in rum Rumbo. I had a great time. I thought it was great. It sounded better to me. The record company went bankrupt, not because of me, <laughs> but because of a Peter Frampton record that they'd done. It was called Come Alive 13 or something. Oh, I don't know. right. And they sent hundreds of thousands of copies out and thinking it was going to be huge. And for some reason, it wasn't. They all got returned. It killed the record company. Because right, this would have been 20, 30 years after Frampton comes alive. Someone thought it was a good idea. Yeah, no. And it, it, it wound up being the thing that ended the record company. So my record never came out. But I remember playing it for somebody, a good friend of mine actually from Canada, and she said, you know what, your demos are better. Like what? No, they're not. What are you talking about? She said, "I know it doesn't. You, this sounds better, sonically, but the vibe on the demos is better." And I was sitting with Stuart Copeland, Miles' younger brother, telling him this little story, and he said, "Greg, of course." He's like, "There's a massive difference between creating and recreating. Yeah. They're right. not the same thing." And I've never, I'll never forget him looking at me. Who's one of my drum idols? I wanted to be Stuart when I was a teenager. Yeah. You know, yep. that's it. So I've. Since that time, any time I got a spare five bucks, I would invest it into something where I could, like Tyler was doing with his computer, because the technology at that point was so good. Right. You can it can become your master. Yep. And do you remember what uh, that particular song came from? The demo was that your piano that's at the core of it. It was different every time. There were lots of things from his Logic demo that uh -huh. were just stock Logic sounds, but because he's such a great musician and such a great composer, we we would either keep it or we would use it as like, well, this is the benchmark. If we can't beat this, no. we have it, and it feels right. So sometimes the bass sounds would be from his Logic demo. Sometimes I was able to beat it, and and we would know between Josh, Tyler, and me, we would know if it, yeah. we felt like, okay, this is better, and if it's not, we'll just keep it. Um, I, you know, one thing I, 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 I actually really regret is I produced that record for a very low fee. I don't regret that at all, at all. But the person managing me at the time, who will go nameless, who was a good manager, but they said, uh, if they ask to share production credit, you shouldn't do that because you took such a low fee. And at the end of the process, Tyler did come to me and say, is it okay if I have you know you put your name first greg but like can we share and i was like uh yeah that always feels awkward I, I know. normally i don't mind yeah but i said no and i feel like that was a mistake because it really like his his work is all over that record you know especially when we're pulling from his original masters it was a, kind of a another lesson hard learned you know it's like the money just doesn't matter at no, the end of the thing no. it's all about like how does this sound in 20 years from exactly. now exactly the relationship you know, I have never worked with them since. Got to play that, a long game. Is that partly yeah. why? Probably. Is that possibly entirely why? Maybe. I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, I'm so friendly with them. But, um, yeah, it's like every time I walk through the studio door, it's always like, oh, I could do that better. Yeah. You know, if it's a tiny little thing or a like huge thing like that. But anyway, I'm a huge fan of recognizing do we have a little piece of gold in front of us? Right. I don't care who came up with it. We, we'd be nuts to not incorporate that, yeah. that gold. Build upon it. Yeah. Totally. Definitely. And um, the whole sort of, uh, I seem to remember, I mean, it goes off in that kind of queen sort of dramatic place. Was that something that was built into his demo or is that something you guys came up with in the studio? Without question, it was built into the roadmap that he walked wow. in with. Yeah, amazing. And I'm such a a, a a drama queen that I love. I love feeling like I'm on a music roller coaster. Yes, and, and that really, song does. So they were sort of a dream act for me to work with because it's all about. So I hate seeing the joke coming. You know. Good point. I I hate it when you can see the punchline coming you sort of know what it is i love being sucker punched by it and i like art that way too i, yes. I like art that's full of surprise and um so it was really i just i definitely like just kind of ramped up what they gave me but cool. their script tyler's script was so tight and the ending to just change keys i can't even remember now the, the whole end where it kind of comes out of that giant bridge and then goes to this 
sort of crazy chorus that was all in his framework it was yeah wow yeah oh yeah he's he's brilliant he's he's brilliant he's really really brilliant he's again it's part of my regret of like not i think he should have been recognized for the production as well and even now was that done with ian mcgregor it was yeah uh because the drum sounds are great. I, I, I mean, to me, like, I love, you know, we've worked together on so many things. I, I love those tight, dead drum sounds where you really feel like you're in the room or maybe in the closet right. with the drummer. Yeah. And those are just great sounds. They're just punchy enough. They sit underneath the piano in a, a really nice way. And mm-hmm. I know you and Ian like came up with this whole other miking technique where you put mics underneath cymbals as opposed to on top. And it, You know, the drum sound at my old studio at Rocket Carousel was very much a hybrid combo of things that I have learned from you over the many times we've worked together and I continue to learn from you every time we work together. Um, uh, Eric Valentine became uh, a friend of mine. I wound up being his first uh, client to buy one of his consoles. Mm. So we started sharing a lot of information and and Eric does this whole thing. He calls it, um, instead of overheads, he calls it underheads. And... um, uh, it's about rejection and like a figure eight pattern, and so you could just you know you eliminate toms and and you have symbols and they're not quite as harsh as the overheads. And sometimes you want that harsh thing in the overhead. Sure, you yeah. don't. Um, also, the sound of those drums is really the drums, and it was in this room here working with you where the great drummer Matt Chamberlain said, "Greg, there's a drum kit for sale from Don Bennett up in Seattle, right? And it's a 1940 Radio King Slingerland kit. Is that what you had, Radio Kings? I didn't know that." For wow, years, those that are was, always amazing sounding kits. Those are the drums on the Twenty One Pilots Vessel album. Wow. It's a nineteen forty. It's an old big band kit. Yeah, like Gene Krupa, Louis Belson. Like twenty six kick or twenty six kick. Uh huh. Huge kick drum. Yeah. Which just sounded like a great sounding kick drum. It didn't really sound massive and bonhomy to me. It just sounded like great. And the drums did sort of sound like like how I imagine Barney Rubble from the Friend- Flintstones sounding if he was, you know, and I think there's an episode where he does drum. Yes, he does. He's like a jazz drummer, but they sound like caveman drums to me, and I really love that. I love that sound, yeah. It's just boxy, and it does feel like you're rolling rocks down the down it's bedrock. Like you're in Joshua Tree, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like if Joshua Tree had a sound, that's sort of what that, <laughs> that drum kit was. And so uh, we had, a, you know, we experimented with a lot of stuff, miking those drums, and it, but the source was so great it's always the way like that kick drum i remember when it came out of the the case it just (laughs) sounded great amazing sounded really incredible um and josh was a really fun drummer to record too he was really up for it fantastic energy he would we were also excited to work on this music and we all kind of felt this like this is the moment you know not knowing what the future would be Um, and he was sort of indefatigable he could just go out and like do take after take after take he hit really hard wow and he would come in and he'd get really excited by the drum sounds. And the more I kind of ch- chased it with Ian, the more excited he would get. And um, it was like the ceiling becomes your floor and that ceiling becomes your floor. And exactly, we going exactly. And going and going yeah. and that, No, that's great when you have that with an artist where you push each other. And that's why I love us working together because we, we're always just throwing ideas back and forth to each other. And in, in the end, the record gets better. And everybody's like, yeah, this was like so worth it you know totally. where we walked in the room today it felt good nothing wrong with it but where we ended up is amazing that's why i'm hesitant to do a lot of pre-production and some of my favorite people do a lot of pre-production but for me i feel like you just never know what's going to happen when you show up in the room whatever it is whether it's somebody's garage or whether it's a amazing studio like this you just don't know how one tiny little thing will inform maybe nothing or maybe everything or maybe some part of it and I like being nimble I like being able to pivot and uh, so I remember like a huge part of the sound of Vessel is that drum kit which you know the sound of the drums changes everything and of course the songs are great and they're great and Tyler's a great performer he's a great singer and he gives you this crazy manic energy and he gives you the tiny sensitive energy and he gives you everything you want he's a great artist but I remember the cool thing. That was one of the first records I mixed on that undertone oh, audio that console. Was on Eric's console. It was wow. on Eric's console. Might be the first album I mixed on it. Wow! And I asked Eric to to give me two mix buses on it. And so my approach at the time was, 
um, the middle section was a bunch of like mix bus gear, analog gear, and I would put that on mix bus one, which for me was the music, the band bus. Uh -huh. Mix bus two was inside the thing, and it was just a clear path straight to the master, the tube, vacuum tube master output of the console. Oh. And I would crank the Shadow Hills master and compressor on the band, and I was really into this unit at the time, the SPL, um, what's it called? Transient. Oh, Vi trans Transient Designer? Yeah, or no, it's the Vitalizer. Oh, the Vitalizer, I love the, yeah. I love it's the like a harmonic design. generator kind of thing. It's a weird thing. It's yes. like kind of an excited, but also it's this weird like bass thing, and you can compress the bass frequencies. And I, I just kept like, playing with all that, and I got the band to this really kind of like juiced up state, and then his vocals would bypass all of that, and then it would feed into Pro Tools, and I'd do a little bit more to the mix right. bus there. But that approach really affected the drums as wow. well yeah because the thing i loved about that record and the, the the piano sound and the drum sound is it had this thick kind of lower mid-range and that's always hard to get because you know the tendency is always to clean that stuff out and right when you clean that stuff out yeah everything's nice and clear and has a home but some of the soul some of the power really gets lost and the thing i remember about that is it just had this thickness but never felt muddy or murky or congested it just had this way of just kind of roaring through in those frequencies and that's so tough to get i have to also give a little credit more than a little credit to howie weinberg who mastered the that best record. the best like mr vibe and, and I remember something he did that really affected exactly what you're complimenting the record uh, regarding. Um, he took out a little tip-top high-end. He rolled it off. Wow. Like tape will do. That's not what mastering engineers usually do. And how cool is it that he, and he told me he was doing it. He said, I'm actually going to reduce some of the real like 18K and up. Like I'm going to roll it off. And I thought, really? Because I love all that detail. Me too. And he said, yeah, I said, I think it sounds cool. He's like, I'll send it to you. Tell me what you think. And it did that. It changed the focus to yes. more of a low mid roar, is right. exactly as you just said. And I loved it. I love, he just really helped push it a little further into whatever I was trying to do. He really helped kind of focus it. And I love what he did. Howie is such an intuitive mastering engineer, you oh, know. Yeah. He, he is all feel. Uh, recently he did a band uh, for me that was kind of um, a modern take on Motley Crue wow. where it had that sort of 80s energy but it had a alternative more modern feel to the groove and the bass lines mm -hmm. how he just had this way of like capturing that spirit that energy but without it sounding processed because you know how all those records then were super high gain guitars yeah. and everything was really edgy and kind of your your initial reaction to the records were like wow but 20 seconds later you'd just be this hurts <laughs> and, and he had this way of just taking these mixes and keeping that roar that energy mm. but it never had that harshness now howie's pretty pretty special he's an amazing record maker he's yeah. an amazing guy to link arms with and, yeah. you know help you kind of be cool and really good at sandwiches too like you you want something greg yeah you must be hungry let me get you let me get you some food yep <laughs> there's only one howie you know uh, I, I used to i used to fly to new york all the time to uh, you know master with him which i stopped doing because i realized like i don't know the sound of his room he knows it <laughs> yes but hanging with him was always like yeah. the fun you yeah. know 